Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us on today's show, where you will learn about the grieving brain, love, loss, and healing. My first guest is Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor. She is an associate professor of psychology at the University of Arizona, where she directs the Grief, Loss, and Social Stress Lab, also known as GLASS, which investigates the effects of grief on the brain and body. Dr. O'Connor earned a doctorate from the University of Arizona in 2004 and completed a fellowship at UCLA. Following a faculty appointment at UCLA Cousins Center for Psychoneuroimmunology, she returned to the University of Arizona in 2012. Her work has been published in the American Journal of Psychiatry, Biological Psychiatry, and Psychological Science, and featured in Newsweek, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. She's also the author of The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss. Oh, Mary Frances, thanks for joining me today. It's so nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Lisa. Well, I, I love exploring these topics because, you know, we, we all know that the loss of someone we love is not a happy event. And yet yeah. how we sort of process and package that loss can impact our well-being. Absolutely. And it's such a universal experience. I think as much as we don't want to think about it because we're so anxious about death and loss, at the same time, it really does affect everyone at some point. Yes. It's a universal experience. It is a guarantee and there's no way out of it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is it so hard for us to wrap our head around this notion when our loved one has passed? Like they're here one day and in many cases they're fine. You know, we're engaging with yeah. them and then the next minute, poof, in an instant, it's over. It's changed. It's gone. Yes. Or it's gone to the rest of the world. You know, I take a perspective, a neuroscientific perspective. And and really, when we bond with someone, a spouse, a child, a sibling, a very close friend, all of the neurochemistry of our brain is sort of motivating us to seek them out, to spend time with them, to be with them, to enjoy them when we're with them. And usually, you know, every morning when you, when you, you know, kiss your kids goodbye, they go off to school and you kiss your spouse and they go off to the office, you know that they're going to come back, that they're going to come home, that you could go find them if, you know, some event happened. And that attachment belief that they are out there in the world, that they are your one and only that needs to be found if, if you lose touch with them, that is such a strong overriding belief in the brain. And so if you think about it this way, you know, sometimes I describe the brain is like a predictive organ. We have it to help us to understand what might happen next. That's part of how it evolved. And the idea that someone might not come back to us, that's not a very good prediction, right? Right. Death is, thank God, a very unusual event. But the first day that you wake up next to that empty space in the bed, it doesn't really, your brain hasn't really understood yet, but they're not coming back. In fact, we hear this, we hear people say this, I feel like they're just going to walk back through the door. Yes. And in the case of my aunt who passed, her partner of nearly 40 years, he still says that almost yeah. 10 months later. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the thing. It takes our brain a long time to to sort of unlearn or relearn a bunch of new habits, right? Because everything we do day to day when we live with someone incorporates that other person like a dance, right? In the house. Indeed. 
and and also it just that persistent belief i can't say how strong it is how much it influences the way we think tell us for a minute the differences between in our brain between when there has been trauma and when there is this the, the the grief and loss of a loved one because there there are differences right yeah yeah it's very interesting i think you know grief has not been studied systematically historically at least in psychology very much that's fortunately changing but what people originally thought was that grief was just a type of depression or a type of trauma. And what we understand now, in part because we understand the neurobiology a little better, is that grief is distinct. So, for example, with trauma, there is usually a traumatic event, although that can be a repeated event uh, in the case, say, for example, of abuse. But usually there is an event and we come to expect these bad things to happen in the world because of because of this trauma we've experienced. Grief is different in that it really is focused around the relationship to that beloved person. So while we feel the loss of them as though part of ourself is missing. It isn't necessarily that we expect that other people, for example, are going to die in our life. Now, you can have an overlap. People can have both trauma and grief, just like you can have both depression and anxiety. But we do think of them as being somewhat separate and even treat them somewhat separately. This is fascinating because <laughs> we tend to lump them together, right? We, we mm-hmm. see the, the loss of our loved one as a traumatic event. Yeah. But what I think you're saying is that the brain's response to trauma is different than the brain's response to the loss of a loved one. Yes. And part of the reason that I say that is, you know, with the loss, when you think, well, what have you lost, really? What's what's gone now? When we bond with someone, it's really creates these neurobiological changes in our brain. So for example, in uh, in voles that mate for life, we can actually see in their brain, there are epigenetic changes that happen when those voles have become each other's one and only. So <laughs> these changes, right, that happen in the brain are 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 permanent. And so now we have to think about how does the brain then understand the fact that this person isn't there? And, and it really has to do with, you know, sometimes I hear people describe, I just so much want them to be back. And that is a different feeling than I'm very traumatized. And I and I can't I feel hopeless or helpless in the world. Those are slightly different. It may sound yes. like splitting hairs, but I think they are different. Oh, I I, I, I hear you. And I, I, I do see what you're saying. Mm. Um, grief causes us so many emotions. I mm. mean, it's really like a stew. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> no, the, you know, running the gamut from sort of the, you know, the, the sadness and the despair to the, you know, the anger and the rage. Yes, absolutely. And I think people are often shocked by both the intensity of the emotions that they experience, like the volume dial just got turned up. And also, I think grief is very frequently not what people are expecting it to be like. And even if you have had grief over someone who has died previously in your life, a new loss may bring with it very different feelings. I wanted to ask you about that because mm. you know we it, it came to my mind as you were speaking that we think we know how we might respond to the loss mm-hmm. let's say of an elderly grandparent you know when we're young sure we experience that loss and that response is very different to the loss of our partner absolutely i sometimes say you know the loss the grief that we feel is really an extension of the love that we felt. And certainly we feel very different kinds of love for different people in our lives, don't we? Indeed. So maybe it doesn't, maybe it's not so surprising that the grief feels very different. And, you know, one of the feelings that people really struggle with sometimes is relief. So often we feel a great deal of relief when a person dies and then you feel terrible guilt thinking, well, how can I feel relief about this? 
So lots of unexpected experiences. When there's been a prolonged illness or somebody has suffered, yes. you know, for a long time, there is some solace when they finally go. And I can definitely Absolutely. see, you know, how there there can be guilt as well. Like, oh, how could you be thinking that was a good thing that that person finally died, you know? That's right. Yes, that's right. And, you know, we have to remember that there are also... Sometimes we call them uh, losing, sometimes I call it losing the less than loved one, right? Not everyone that we are connected to makes our life better. And so you have situations where an ex-spouse dies or uh, a person who was an alcoholic and had a very difficult road to hoe, but also made your own life very difficult. And that also leads to its own set of really complicating confusing experiences. I want to talk with you about complicated grief, but I want to save it for the next segment because I think it will take longer than sort of a, 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 a finishing thought or a topper, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the things that people will often ask when they are going through this is like, I just want it to end. How long is this going to go on? Like, I don't think I yeah. can, you know, do this forever. And, yeah. you know, what what do we say? What can we offer to somebody who is in that place. Mm, you know, I do hear this a lot. And actually, I hear this a lot from clinicians, even when I lecture to medical residents, they all want to know, but really, like, how much is normal? And I try <laughs> yes. to tell them. <laughs> yes, the there spectrum really, of normal. <laughs> yes, but there really isn't an end date. Here's an example. You know, it's a very different uh, analogy. But if I say to you, when did you get over your wedding day? Right. That's a really <laughs> bizarre question. Yeah. There's no answer to that. And yet that's very much what it's like. There was an event. It was profoundly life changing. It impacted my whole family and all the people I, I you know, interact with. And now I, I live this slightly different identity. That's true with widowhood as well, isn't it? Or losing a child. What does it mean to be a parent who doesn't have a child? How do we understand that? So, but to help people feel a little more at ease, the intensity of those waves of grief that knock you over, the intensity does usually recede a little bit. And more than that, grief is different from grieving. So even if we have grief, even if we get knocked off our feet again and again, the way we understand that experience changes over time. It feels more familiar. You develop better ways to deal with it. And you also start to restore a meaningful life. And that helps too. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about that, about the meaning making in the in the grief process. But we should go take a break. So okay. <laughs> let's take that pause. To learn more about the work of Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor, please visit maryfrancisoconnor.com. We're talking about her book, The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss. You can connect with Dr. O'Connor on Twitter at Dr. MFO. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Hang on a minute. Before we pause, I want to share how much architecture and design are a part of my everyday life and impact my happiness. Many of you know that before I followed my bliss in positive psychology, I studied architecture. So it's no surprise that I'm always reading the latest design magazines and creating lookbooks of trending designs to use on interior spaces for projects with my honey, who is a residential architect. If you're anything like me, you also enjoy redecorating your space. Wouldn't it be great to be able to see your interior design ideas come to life? And that's why I love Redecor, the number one home designer's playground. Redecor is a home design app and a mobile game in one that's fun and inspiring to play. Redecor is a mindfully creative outlet that lets your imagination run wild as you experiment with colors, materials, and textures as you design room after room. I really enjoy participating in design challenges and seeing what designers from all over the world are creating. Redecor is an interactive platform that is a place to play, explore designs, find inspiration, and connect with others who share your passion for home decor. The graphics are so realistic and detailed, and you're able to customize every piece of the room. They've even got style guides with tips, tricks, and advice for decorating. Enter your designs in challenges and let other players be the judge. Submit your best designs and reap the rewards if you come out on top. Test and cultivate your creativity with Redecor today. 
Practice your interior design skills and express your creativity with Redecor. Download Redecor for free on the App Store or Google Play Store. That's R-E-D-E-C-O-R on the App Store or Google Play Store. Now let's take that pause. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. And we're back. But before we get back to it, let's talk about why home is the epicenter of happiness. Home is the canvas for creative expression, connection, and memory making. My home is the hub of my family. Home is my haven, castle, sanctuary, recording studio, office, boardroom, creativity, laboratory, and base camp for my peeps. And home is where comfort lives. Get ready for Joybird's President's Day sale. Joybird offers crisp, modern, customizable furnishings and accessories for every space. Joybird is furniture that fits your style in a wide variety of vibrant and durable designs. It's like visiting a virtual candy store for your home with more than 18,000 customized options to help you express your one-of-a-kind style. I absolutely adore Joybird Soto Chair that lives in the perfect spot next to the fireplace in my bedroom where I snuggle up with a good book and a crackling fire. Don't know where to start? Joybird's design specialists are standing by to help make your vision a reality for free. Ordering online has never been easier or more fun. From design to customer care, Joybird has you covered. Joybird Furniture stands by its quality and craftsmanship. If it's not everything you'd hope for, send it back within 90 days. Each piece is made with incredible care using responsibly sourced materials that are free of harmful chemicals. Joybird is also committed to a more sustainable future by partnering with groups like One Tree Planted to help conserve and restore Earth's precious natural resources. Simply put, Joybird furniture is made with top-notch stain and scratch-resistant fabrics and comes with a limited lifetime warranty. Joybird furniture can handle anything your family throws at it. Literally, create a space that brings you joy with Joybird. Visit joybird.com slash happiness and get 35% off your purchase. That's 35% off at joybird.com slash happiness. Now let's get back to the conversation. And we're back continuing the conversation with my guest today, Mary Frances O'Connor. We're talking about the grieving brain, love, loss, and healing. Let's get back to it. Mary Frances, just prior to the break, we said we were going to come back and touch upon the differences between grief and complicated grief. And I think Mm -hmm. this is a good point to kind of dip in to differentiate. Yeah, I like to make this distinction because since we know that grieving lasts and lasts, then you ask yourself, well, well, how do we how do we know who might need intervention, who might need help? And this was exactly the issue in the 1990s. A bunch of grief researchers and clinicians came together and tried to develop a, a group of criteria. What symptoms might we expect to see when people are not adapting very well so that we would know this is the group of people we want to try to intervene and help with. And that research has now proceeded for a couple of decades. And the the DSM-5 will actually include prolonged grief disorder in its upcoming revised edition. So prolonged grief disorder and complicated grief aren't identical, but I'm going to use the same terms here because it will be just easier for, for the general audience. I like the term complicated grief because I think of it this way. You know, grief is a natural response to loss. So, for example, if you break your leg, you're not actually doing anything to heal. You're not, you know, thinking hard about it or something. Those those bones are knitting back together on their own. And that's and that's a natural process of healing that takes time and might require support, right? Might require a cast. But what happens sometimes is there are complications. So you get an infection or there's a secondary trauma to the to the leg, right? Another break. And now we really do need doctors to go in and intervene and help. I think of complicated grief in a similar way. If we can identify some complications, then we can help to address those to get people back on that natural healing path. 
Great answer, actually. I mean, it, ma- it makes perfect sense. And and how? What would be some of the telltale signs of somebody who mm. had moved beyond just the generic, for lack mm-hmm. of a better term, generic grief and loss to this complicated grief? Yeah, you know, I think it can be so difficult for an individual. As I said, sometimes they say, "This is the worst I have ever felt," right? So it's hard to imagine. Well, how do I not have complicated grief if this is the worst that I've ever felt? But in fact, when we look across the spectrum, we're looking at things like the person who is unable to get up and go out to work. Mm-hmm. Right? It's impacting their daily life. I had a participant in a research study say to me, "You know, why would I give my children?" in bar mitzvahs if their grandmother isn't there to see it, right? So we've really changed the way we're interacting in life. It's not just affecting us. It's affecting our family. It's affecting our our work life. And and so that inability to function in in a resilient way is where we start to think this is becoming something that could use intervention, Understood. And there's no timetable between the two, or is there? You know, well, there's not in the sense that, as I said before, grieving, you know, is just a a change in life. We do look to, because many of our cultural institutions and religious institutions think of one year as a very uh, specific time period where there are a lot of sort of anniversary things that we imagine. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't diagnose prolonged grief disorder until at least a year after the death because it as we said, it does take a long time even to just sort of figure out if you're on the healing trajectory or not. Uh, So so we do make that distinction. So for example, somebody is not operating well in their lives two, Mm -hmm. three, four, five years out after Mm -hmm. the loss of a loved one. Might that indicate that there's an issue that needs attention? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, my experience has been that when people are told what, you know, some of the symptoms are, or they read more about complicated grief or prolonged grief disorder, they're very often able to say, oh, yes, now I see. It's not just me. This isn't just what people go through. This is something specific. And that there might be a way for me to actually get help because we see people, it's been decades, and we've seen people who get targeted intervention and actually go on then to restore a meaningful life. That's very promising. That's actually, that's wonderful because I do know that there are people out there who do suffer for prolonged amounts of time in that complicated grief state where they're just not bouncing back. They're not, they're not thriving. That's right. Exactly. It's not that we don't expect grieving to change you. We just want you to also like the person that you've changed into. Mm. Oh, I like that. Tell us a little bit about the brain in grief. Like what kinds of changes do we see and in what parts of the brain? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And, you know, the neurobiology of grief sort of studying this has grown up at the same time as a field as neuroscience as a field has grown up. And so the way we think about um, looking at the brain has changed over time. So I'll I'll say this first. We mostly have studies of grief and not grieving, right? Mm. So we, we don't actually have a lot of studies, very, very few, where we do a neuroimaging scan of the same person, you know, maybe two months and then a year after the death of someone. We mostly have just the one moment in time when they come in and they're having, uh, they're feeling grief in the scanner. However, having said that, Grief is complex. And so, of course, it involves lots of parts of your brain. It it involves memory. It involves uh, being able to take perspective. It involves emotion and even things like, you know, regulating your heart rate. And uh, all of these different uh, parts of the brain are involved in grief. But one thing we have noted is that there are, uh, this is sort of new work coming out. Saren Seeley, one of my uh, graduate students who's now um, uh, got her own uh, uh, lab and, and research, she did a study where we just asked people to lie in the scanner just as they were. No task for them to do, just think whatever comes to your mind. And one of the things she discovered was 
the brain is sort of in different states at different moments, different connections between parts of the brain uh, so that you can see sort of uh, you, you might think of them as uh, uh these interconnected patterns that we're in for a little period of time, and then we shift. And what she found was that people who had complicated grief tended to dwell in one state longer than others. And this is a bit of an interpretation, but you might almost say they got stuck in that state for hmm. longer than people who were not experiencing such severe grief. And so I think this is helpful maybe to think about how does the brain and the mind connect so that we might try to do interventions that make sense given what we're seeing with the neurobiology. And I'm wondering, at the interventions, are they grief related or are they attention related? How we work with our own minds Oh, that's a wonderful question. That's a very sophisticated question. You know? <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I would say that it's both, honestly. So one of the things in complicated grief treatment, which is an empirically supported multiple randomized clinical trials, complicated grief treatment, for example, helps people to figure out how to move into the feeling of grief and then out of it again. So teaching them this flexibility. And a lot of that has to do, as you say, with where we put our attention. So for example, uh, in this type of therapy, we ask people to tell the story of what happened when their loved one died, we actually record them telling that story, and then we ask them to listen to it every day. And the reason is, it takes skill, it takes practice to kind of go there, right? Into yeah, that most way. definitely. And then also find how to get yourself back into day to day life, right? So learning these skills to deal with that feeling flexibly. So it's like a prolonged exposure type of therapy. It is related yeah. to prolonged exposure. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's amazing. So it's it's agility, mental agility training, but that happens to focus on the grief event. That's exactly right. Learning what it feels like to have grief, which is especially important for people who are really trying to avoid that experience <laughs> of feeling yes. grief, which is very common, uh, and also to be able to pay attention to the present moment. Who is with you here now? How do you feel connected to the people around you? Which leads me to the final question or our talking point is the, mm -hmm. the restoration of, of a meaningful life after these events happen. Yeah. You know, I think when people ask, when will this end? They want these waves of grief to stop. But I think you know, if we only think about, you know, when are we feeling better as just being when the waves of grief knock us over less often, I'm not really sure that that's what people mean by feeling like they've adapted, feeling like they've accepted the death. And so we also think about meaning making, as you described, how do we understand this chapter of our life? And how do we imagine the next chapter of our life? So that sort of narrative therapy can be very helpful. But even just thinking through, um, what is it that I'm feeling now? What am I enjoying now? How might I do a little bit more of that, connect with a few more people or have a deeper conversation so that I can actually use what I've learned. This desire to seize the day sometimes is what people derive as insight. Or other people feel like I had no idea that, you know, these people I didn't know I would become so close to were going to be so supportive of me. So figuring out how to really have a restored and having learned something in life as well. So it, it, would you say it's um, a, a type of post-traumatic growth? I think that's the perfect word for it. That's actually the word I would use. But I would just also caution, this is an insight experience. No one can tell you what you will learn. A device is really not a good idea because it's not the person's own lived experience. So it is post-traumatic growth, but it has to be generated internally. I, I do like like what you're saying about the the, the grief recovery or processing um, 
mm-hmm. journey is, mm-hmm. is the inside experience, right? Like you have to, mm-hmm. you have to be willing to go in in order yeah. to go through. Yeah. And I guess that's, that's the scary part for many. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying. Yeah. It takes enormous courage and resilience. And we find, of course, that it goes better if we have support. And I say that both in a social support, typical kind of way, we need our friends and family, but I think we also need to remember that bereavement is a health disparity. So even with COVID-19, we've seen the rates of mortality are very different in different communities. And that means the rates of grieving are very different as well. And we need to think about supports for people who are experiencing grief on lots of different levels. I think also the normalization and validation of grief, Mm -hmm. because I think as a Western society, the way we handle death and loss, you know, Mm -hmm. we sort of, we outsource it and annex it from our experience. You know, we used to, it all used to happen in the home, right? Yes, that's absolutely right. It was, (laughs) there was, it was much harder to feel that this person might walk back in the door when you had sat for days with their body, Right. right? Yes. You have all these memories of them. Well, that's not really how it happens anymore. And although I'm not necessarily suggesting we should go back to that, there have to be ways for us to talk about it with each other. In fact, part of the point of the book really is, you know, I hope people take something good away from the lens that I give them, but I mostly hope it's a it's a reason to have a conversation with your with your good friends or your colleagues about what you're experiencing. I, I highly recommend this book uh, as somebody who is experiencing a bit of it myself. The grieving <laughs> brain, the surprising science of how we learn from love and loss. My guest today, who I'm so grateful for you to be here, mm-hmm. is Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor. To learn more about Mary Frances's work, please visit maryfrancisoconnor.com. And on Twitter, you can connect at Dr. MFO. Mary Frances, thank you so much. It was a real delight to talk oh, with you. Oh, I feel the same way. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. And we're back continuing the conversation about the grieving brain, love, loss and healing. My next guest is Daniel Shapiro. He is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Brain Research Foundation, a foundation that exists to accelerate discoveries of the human brain by funding pioneering neuroscience research. A graduate of the University of Chicago Law School and lifelong Chicagoan, he has practiced trial law nationally for many years. He enjoys spending his time reading and hanging out with his grown children, and he is the author of The Thin Ledge, A Husband's Memoir of Love, trauma, and unexpected circumstances. Dan, thanks for joining us today on the show. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure. Let's jump right into your book, The Thin Ledge, A Husband's Memoir of Love, Trauma, and Unexpected Circumstances. Why did you decide to chronicle this very intimate journey? Well, I I don't know that it was much of a deliberate decision. I have always written often as a lawyer, but creatively as well. And I found that the challenges were so complex and difficult and steep that the best way for me to keep track of what was going on and think about it and reflect on it was to write. And so I wrote notes to myself. I wasn't really chronicling. I was sort of reacting and writing things that really wouldn't be recognizable as any kind of coherent thinking. And after a period of time, because the experience that I had went on for many years, I decided that I would pull this together, write a bunch more because those notes didn't amount to too terribly much and see if there was an audience for it more broadly. And maybe it would be something that would be helpful. And I'm finding actually that there is an audience for it and that it does, based on the reactions that I'm getting, um, that it does fill a void for people and it does seem to be helpful. 
Well, what you've written is such an intimate account of what happened to you and your family and your wife. I would love for you to share a brief version of, of, of the story. Sure. I'll try to be very brief because I, I think to do more would be to leave a lot out. So my wife and I met when we were in college. We were 19. We dated. I went to law school. We got married in my third year of law school and set up a life in Chicago, which is where we're both from. And we had children. And then when we turned 40, we're the same age. When we turned 40, my wife wound up having a cavernous angioma manifest through a, a brain hemorrhage. Uh, cavernous angioma is a collection of blood vessels that can occur anywhere in your body. Shouldn't happen, but it's one of those illnesses that does. And it uh, makes itself known by bleeding. And depending on the real estate it occupies, it's either a big deal or not a big deal. Because her cavernous angioma was in the middle of her head, it turned out to be a very big deal and not accessible surgically. She then had a second hemorrhage two years later, which was really devastating. She wound up having her ability to see, to speak, to walk around, it lost a lot of mobility. And over a period of the following 15 plus years, she proceeded to degrade a little bit at a time. And ultimately, a year ago, that would be 20 years into her illness, she passed away. In that yes. interim period, my children who were little when, when my wife first became ill were raised by me because that's just sort of how it unfolded. And they're now all grown, and I'm terribly proud of all of them. And they've come through this just in a sparkling, wonderful way. And that's the story. I mean, that's that's the short version. And what I find so compelling about your story and the book, The Thin Ledge, is from a man's perspective, right? You know, suffering is suffering and, and loss is loss. And yet I think one of the things I find most profound to me is the intimacy with which you explore the story, you know, from a very different perspective. It's not textbook. It's typically women that write these kinds of, of memoirs. And maybe that is where you're finding that, that sweet spot of connection with your own audience. Well, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I, I think one of the things that, well, well, two things on that, I suppose. One, my thought was that if I don't write a really intimate version of the story that is sharing with the reader a lot of what happened in some detail. It really wouldn't be much point in writing the book because the, the experience really couldn't be shared, I thought, and it wouldn't have any meaning to a reader unless there was a full appreciation for what the experience was. And the only way to relate that effectively was to provide a lot of facts and that may be where my training as a lawyer sort of kicked in a little bit. And so it's factually <laughs> probably more complete than one is used to and more revealing than is necessarily comfortable for the author. But I thought necessary in terms of the gender issue, you're spot on. I mean, I, I, I think one of the really interesting reactions that I'm getting from the book is that men who I've known for many years and who are friends of mine feel licensed to relate to me on a more personal, candid, intimate level than was the case before. It, it was sort of the the act of sharing at that level of intimacy gave them license to share back, which people, I think, seem to have a sort of hidden need for. And some of that need is being expressed. You and I spoke before we started recording our interview about, you know, what could be construed as the the woo-woo nature, or you mentioned the Oprah-esque feeling of the triumph over adversity or of speaking about, you know, harvesting happiness or human happiness. And I don't doubt that in the 15, 20 years of this journey that you've questioned yourself about purpose and happiness and the why. 
Certainly, that's true, and I and I don't mean to denigrate um, all the good things that Oprah does. And there was no <laughs> no, we get it. we get it. <laughs> right, right. There's no intent to be negative about that, but the, it is sort of a cultural phenomenon that she reaches people in that way. In the moment, I don't know that I was doing a lot of learning, at least consciously or deliberately. I, I think I was experiencing. I was using writing to sort it out and to reflect and be less reactive and more thoughtful. After the fact, though, as the world is starting to organize itself in my mind in this new reality, where I'm not dealing with the day-to-day -day adversity of the circumstance, you use the word in our pre-taping conversation, alchemy, and, and it's a very good word because I think what it suggests is that it that there is sort of almost a magical transformation from adversity to a deeper appreciation post adversity of happiness and and a, a, it's a weird thing that i can't explain intellectually but the reality is that a sunny day I, I notice those things and I live those things differently. I, I have a greater sense of appreciation for the lovely things that life holds than I did before when those nice parts of life were really obscured by watching somebody that I loved suffer. I mean, it's very hard to see that and to maintain your sanity, uh, let alone having any appreciation for, you know, the nice things in life. After the fact, though, there's really this enhanced sense of appreciation that I didn't anticipate. And to be honest, I don't understand. I can't really explain, but I can tell you that it's true. Yeah. I think many of us can can relate to what you're sharing. You know, it, it is the uh, I think it's embedded in the experience to those whose eyes are open. It does seem to be, although I can't speak for anybody else since I don't understand it myself. I don't know that, you know, what the mechanic is for anybody else in their life. But I, I can tell you that if experience is common and I I do believe that it is, I think, you know, we're all unique in certain ways. But I also think that we all share a common life experience in certain ways. And and I suspect this is one of those shared things that post adversity, life just brightens up a little bit. It's like walking out of a dark room and, and it's just sunnier than it was before. You're different than you were before. Yeah. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation with lawyer and author Daniel Shapiro. His book is The Thin Ledge, A Husband's Memoir of Love, trauma, and unexpected circumstances. To learn more, please visit danielpshapiro.com. On Facebook, that page is Daniel P. Shapiro, and you'll have to find him for yourself if it's 57, 75, we're not quite sure. And on Instagram, you can find him at D.P. Shapiro. We'll be right back, and that is a promise. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life, a boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness, is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. Welcome back. We're talking about the grieving brain, love, loss, and healing. Let's get back to the conversation with my guest, Daniel Shapiro. So Dan, prior to the break, we were talking about your experience of 
sort of the lights coming back on after loss for a bit. And I think, you know, when we lose somebody that close to us, we never really get over it, you know, completely, but that you started to experience uh, a little bit more sweetness and joy in your life again over little things. That's all true. And I would say, just to pick up on the point, I, I think you're absolutely correct that you, at least in my experience, one doesn't entirely get over the loss of a loved one. But the role that that loss plays changes, I, I have found. I, you know, I, I lost my wife. And before that, I had uh, my, my dad passed away at a relatively young age. And I, I have found that uh, in both instances, the way that I remember those people in my life, both of whom were central to me, really winds up being a part of the attributes that you carry around to use in your life. I, I am finding that. It, it's, it's very often that I will pause for a moment and reflect and remember, but not in a way that has the sting to it that the loss had initially. And for sure, uh, with the loss of my wife, because it really was a, a, a loss in slow motion over years as she left us a little bit at a time, there was more time, there had been more time to adjust to that loss. And I, I think there is something essentially positive about her presence for me, her continued presence for me. And it makes my life broader and more uh, full. And it continues to be a positive for me. So, you know, on the heels of a recent loss, it all feels quite, you know, terrible and sad. And it morphs into something more useful than that. And I think this speaks to the resiliency of the human spirit. You know that most of us who experience loss at some point will return back to that pre-loss state of engagement in the world or happiness. And there's been a significant amount of research done in this area. And then there are some of us who won't, you know, that they get stuck in, in the grief and loss and it becomes very complicated and very hard to overcome. And then there are those that I think end up exceeding their pre-loss state because the self-discovery, you know, what they've learned about themselves and their place in the world changes, you know, through the, the work or the projects that they serve. I think that's all consistent with my experience. I saw people who were close to my wife really be utterly destroyed by this experience. I, I think it's a very different kind of thing, I suspect, to lose a child than to lose a wife. I think both are meaningful, but they're, they seem to be fundamentally different. And I've, I've seen people who have lost uh, kids. Uh, thank goodness I'm not among them, but that seems to be a loss that is more difficult to manage, which from a distance, I see it. And I think I can understand it a little bit, but not entirely. Fortunately for me, that burden has not been visited on me. So I, I don't have that to deal with. I was going to jump in and talk about the spiritual aspect of up the journey, you know, and you mentioned about, you know, the, the loss of a child and I'm Jewish and in the Jewish tradition that when a child predeceases the parent, there is no, there is no period of mourning because you never get over it. Mm, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yes, it's true. And Yes, it's true. You know, but both sides of the coin. I'm, I'm, I have no doubt. So I know that you were touched by spirituality in some way on your journey, on the path that you still remain. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. I, I will tell you how that happened, what happened, and then you can decide whether it really is a spiritual thing or not. <laughs> I, I, I'm not the decider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I, I'm not sure that I would say it was spiritual, but um, a rabbi friend of mine, I think, disagrees with me. And so what I found was because the the loss of my wife was over a long period of time, 
it raised all sorts of difficult subjects for me about what was my obligation, uh, what was my obligation to myself, what was my obligation to her, how was I going to lead my life. A lot of decision points came up. And I was, I, I had a great difficulty in navigating the moral dimensions of all of that. It was, I think I'm a moral person, but certainly flawed and also unfamiliar with this landscape. I mean, it was really, it was tough. And so I would talk to people who I respected, whose judgment I cared about. And I would say in conversation, you know, what do you think? What is my obligation here? What can I do? What can I not do? And no matter what they said, which was always pretty consistent, I was always wondering whether they were being honest with me because I, I didn't know whether they were just speaking out of kindness, speaking out of empathy, or whether they were really sort of sharing with me what their true moral judgment was. What I found was that religion wound up being very helpful because it was and is a code of morality that isn't responsive to my direct inquiry. It exists before me, it will exist after me. And so it's sort of static. And if I said to a clergy member, what does, in my case, Judaism say about this? Uh, how does it tell me what the moral thing is to do or what is the moral thing to do? I would get an answer that was thousands of years old and and didn't was sort of indifferent to me and to kindness and to you know empathy for me or my circumstance it wasn't a me centric thing it was an institutional position on morality which i thought was the sort of the gold standard for honesty and to that extent, I found religion very helpful. And I'm not a religious person, but in that respect, I did find it very helpful. I imagine the way your lawyer mind works, that yeah. it's similar to seeking case law, right, to reference present circumstance or a case you're working on. I think that's exactly right. But in the world of soft-edged moral judgment and human behavior. And the, I guess the process would be similar or the same to finding case law. There is no case law in this, which <laughs> is, is sort of too bad in a way. But that is what I was looking for. I was looking for case law. I was looking for an objective statement of what the moral code is in circumstances like these. And it's interesting you talk about the moral code, because the other thing that comes to mind is that if one has any uh, religious or spiritual practice that involves a working God, right, that the sense that there, that maybe that God betrayed me. I don't recall having that thought, to tell you the truth. I, I think it would be completely natural and understandable. The answer for me was never that clear. I just never understood it well enough to decide that there was a God involved here and that because he was involved or she was involved, it was an act of betrayal or I, I just never sort of logic my way through it like that. I, so while I'm sure a common response to these kinds of circumstances, not really in my experience. And I appreciate you sharing that it wasn't in your experience. And for some people it is. And I think it's so individual, but the idea that you had some, some guidepost through religion is helpful. I think that your open-mindedness and to being present in this process, I mean, you were called to duty and to caregiving and to parenting and sort of juggling it all for so long, I would think if I put myself in your shoes that there's somewhat of an autopilot that goes on. And I don't mean autopilot in terms of emotion, but in terms of functioning, you know, that you've you had so much to manage. Look, I, you know, people would say to me very often, people would say to me, I don't know how you're doing this. And it was such a puzzling thing to hear that because in my mind, 
the thought was, as opposed to what? Right. I mean, there wasn't a lot of choice in the matter no, at the no, time. No. There was no choice. I yeah. mean, you do what you have to do. And, and some of it, I'm sure I didn't do very well. And, but you, you know, you do your best and that's going to have to be enough because that's what life presents. And you, you know, hopefully just keep trying to move forward. And, but, you know, I, I don't know how you do it seemed odd to me because I, oh, well, I actually, I remember thinking, well, is there another way? Because maybe, that would be <laughs> but I, you know, I never found that. We are nearly out of time. And before we go, I want to touch on what I think is the the cornerstone of the book, The Thin Ledge and the story you've told. And that is how that that sweet spot or finding your smile again in some way is tied to where you find yourself now in the world and the projects that you are involved in. Well, I think one thing that is very meaningful to me is in terms of moving forward and and what my uh, ongoing projects are, I've always thought that writing was something that I ought to be doing, but because it was so difficult as a prospect, my my father was a, an artist. He was a painter and being involved in the arts, and I include writing in that, was always a difficult way to make a living. And so not something that I pursued. And now my life has sort of taken me back to writing in a very natural, organic way for me. And at this point in my life and in my career, I'm devoting substantial time to writing the next thing. So one thing that has happened as a result of all this is that it's put me in touch with whatever abilities I have to write and my um, desire to write and, and, you know, my aptitude for it, if I have any, and I think, I think maybe I have a little, I think you do. <laughs> uh, and, and so that's a very positive, a very positive thing for me. And it's also, uh, you know, another large uh, opening for me has been just developing relationships that I didn't have, particularly during, you know, the difficult period of time, the 15 years or so uh, when when I was taking care of my wife and raising my kids. And, you know, there's now more time. I, I have more of a, an opportunity to have relationships, including a new romantic relationship, which wow. um, has much greater meaning for me than it would have, you know, 20 years ago. And and you just as you sort of evolve into the next version of whoever you are, uh, what I found is that I'm, I'm better at being a companion and uh, having having somebody uh, with me and relying on me. I'm just a more mature person. And so that's a nice discovery, too, after many years sort of in abeyance. And I think that's the perfect place to pause for now. And I encourage you to keep on writing and keep on sharing with us. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel Shapiro. Thanks for sharing a, a part of yourself and your story. The Thin Ledge, a husband's memoir of love, trauma, and unexpected circumstances. To learn more about Daniel Shapiro and his work, please visit danielpshapiro.com. Once again, that's danielpshapiro.com. On Facebook, that page is Daniel P. Shapiro, and you'll have to find him for yourself if it's 57, 75. We're not quite sure, but he's there. And on Instagram, you can find him at DP Shapiro. Dan, thanks for joining me on the show today. Lisa, thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen on behalf of my guests, Mary Frances O'Connor and Daniel Shapiro, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. 
Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with TogiNet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.